I appreciate you joining us for this time of Bible study. And as always, I'd like to encourage you, if you have your Bible available, to uh, follow along as we study the Bible together. Let me also encourage you to um, contact us. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. The contact information will be given at the end of the broadcast. Now, we call this Bible study time because we are systematically going through the major keys to Bible study. And we're doing this so that you might better learn how to study the Bible for yourself. Now, we're not using uh, theological, man-made rules of Bible study. We're actually going by the keys that God himself has revealed in his word. The Bible is the word of God, so it must be studied God's way. We can't approach it like any other book. It's the living word of God. And so we've got to trust the Lord to teach us his word by his spirit as we follow the keys that he himself has shown us in the Bible. In our first lesson, we discussed the fact that it's not even possible to understand uh, the spiritual truth of the word of God uh, without the spirit of God. So you must be saved in order to really understand the Bible because it's a spiritual book that is spiritually discerned. And you can, uh, for an example, go to 1 Corinthians 2 uh, concerning that issue where Paul shows that it's by the Spirit of God that we know the things of God. And then in our second study, we considered some things about the doctrine of salvation from the book of Romans, which is the doctrinal book uh, concerning salvation in this present age of grace. And we saw in Romans that salvation is by grace, through faith, plus nothing. It's all in Jesus Christ and how that he died on the cross for our sins, shedding his blood as the ultimate sacrifice to take away our sins. We are redeemed by his blood. We are justified. In other words, declared righteous by God through the righteousness of Christ. On the cross, he took away our sins. And when we trust him as Savior, he gives us his righteousness. And so the, the gospel of Christ is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Now what we must simply do, realize that we're a lost sinner, condemned already, in need of salvation, and then trust fully in the perfect and finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not by works, not at all. The book of Romans makes that clear, that there's none righteous, and we're not saved or justified by any works that we can do. It's all in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. In our last study, we began a short series of lessons on what it means to be a real Bible believer. And that's the next step uh, to understanding the Bible. First, you need to be saved and have the Spirit of God in you, and the Spirit of God dwells in every believer. But second, you must believe the Word of God. God's not going to give spiritual understanding uh, to those who do not believe His Word. Unbelief is sin. Paul said, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Uh, in Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. And so it's very vital that we believe the Word of God and submit to its authority. Uh, it's through faith that we understand, it says in Hebrews. Through faith we understand. Uh, not, not, well, we're going to try to figure things out on our own and, and trust in our own mind and trust in our own uh, brains. Uh, no, God wants us to think and he wants us to study, but we're going to have to believe his word to have understanding. We can't depend on ourselves and understand the word of God. We need God. We need his spirit to teach us. Now, I think all Christians start out believing that the Bible is the word of God. But sadly, many are convinced otherwise by false teachers who claim that there is no perfect Bible available for us today. And there are many false teachers out there like that that are saying those things. And unfortunately, uh, those who are not grounded in the faith are led astray by their false teaching. You know, we must base what we believe about the Bible on what the Bible says about itself and uh, not on what men say about it. We got we to gotta put our trust in the Lord, uh, not in men. I, I believe that the King James Bible is the inspired word of God on the basis of what the Bible says about itself. That's why I believe that. Now, I've heard critics say, 
Well, there's not a verse in the Bible that says the King James Version is the Word of God. There's no verse that says exactly that. Well, that's true, but God promised that His Word would be available to all generations, and He gave us the formula in the Scripture by which we can identify His Word. And if we'll follow that, we'll know where the Word of God is. King James Bible believers are the only ones that believe we have a perfect Bible because we're the ones that believe what the Bible says about itself instead of what Dr. Snodgrass says down at the Apostate Seminary. And there's a lot of people who are putting their confidence in so-called scholarship when they need to put their confidence in the Scriptures. Look, please, in Psalm 118, and notice in Psalm 118, verse 8 and 9. The Bible says in Psalm 118, verse 8, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Uh, don't trust the common man and don't even trust the, the, the high up uh, leadership. Uh, don't trust men at all. Put your confidence in the Lord is what this is saying. Put your confidence in him. By the way, these verses uh, give a good definition of what it means to trust. It said it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So by contrast here, by comparison, by uh, these verses de uh, defining trust as uh, to put confidence in. That's what, it's, that's what it's saying trust is. To put your co Where's your confidence? Is it in what men are saying to you about the Bible? Or is your confidence in what the Bible itself says? Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. So in, in that uh, scripture, we have another idea about what trust is. It's to lean upon. All right. So what are you leaning upon? Where is your confidence? What are you trusting? Now today we're going to consider a simple overview of what the Bible teaches concerning how God gave us the scriptures. How did we get the Bible? What is that process? Uh, I, I believe there's basically a five-step process by which God has given us uh, the Holy Scriptures. And the five steps are distinct, and yet they are related to one another and build upon one another. They demand one another. And so let's begin with the first step. How did we get the Bible? Uh, how is it that God gave us the scriptures? Well, first of all, revelation. That's the first word I want to talk about. We're going to give five steps. The first one is revelation. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, uh, Moses said, The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things which be revealed belong unto us. And so God reveals things to man. Go please to Hebrews chapter number 1. And let's notice in the first couple verses of Hebrews chapter number 1. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So sundry times is talking about basically at various times in the past, divers manners, different ways he did this, but he spake. God did. God spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken, to us, spoken unto us by his son. So he spoke through the prophets in the past. He, he has spoken through his son when he was on the earth and, and Christ gave the word of God. And uh, we know also that he spoke uh, through apostles who wrote scripture in the New Testament. For an example, the apostle Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament, and that's God speaking through him. Uh, those aren't the words of Paul. Those are the words of God. So God has spoken. Uh, God reveals. God has spoken to reveal things to us. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, so that what they said was not their own words from their own will, from their own thoughts. It was God using them as a mouthpiece, speaking his word, revealing things through them. 
And so the first thing is revelation. Fallen man cannot know God unless God reveals himself to us. Thank God that he has. God has revealed himself. The natural revelation of creation and conscience is only partial. God has revealed some things about himself through creation. You can see his power in the things that he's made. And we know some basic moral principles in our conscience that God gave us. So that's a partial revelation. But he has given man a perfect revelation in writing. That's what the scripture is. God revealing himself, revealing his truth, revealing his plan and purpose for the ages. And he does this in writing. And this came by special revelation. And it's understood through spiritual revelation. So you have special revelation and then spiritual revelation. Uh, special revelation has to do with God revealing something new that had been unrevealed before, but now he's speaking uh, through his prophet, speaking through his apostles, speaking through his son. He's speaking to reveal things, new revelation. And then once that's been revealed, we need spiritual revelation to understood what's been uh, given by special revelation. So those two things, let me just say uh, a thing or two about those, and then we'll move on to the next step. Special revelation. Look, please, in he Ephesians chapter number 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, this is an example of special revelation. Paul said in verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now, now in the Bible, mystery is not something that you can't understand. It's actually something that was kept secret, and now it could be understood because it's been revealed, and God wants us to understand so it's got to do with a secret that's been revealed. He said, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. So this was special revelation. Christ revealed something new through Paul. And what, what happened? Paul wrote it down in the scripture. He said in verse 4, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed by his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And what is that mystery? He said in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The mystery is the church, which is the body of Christ. And we'll talk more about that in some studies to come. But I'm reading the passage here to show you in Ephesians 3, verse 1 through 3, he talks about this special revelation that Christ gave through him. But then in verses 4 through 6, he makes it clear, now that it's been written, it, you need the Spirit of God to know that truth. In other words, the Spirit will reveal it to your understanding. Now, it's very important for you to understand that nobody today is getting uh, special revelation. These so-called prophets and apostles uh, on television, for an example. And by the way, there's no, there is no prophets and apostles today. There's no prophets. We don't need a prophet. We have the Bible. The Bible's complete. There's no new revelation. There's no apostles. Uh, that was a foundational office in the first century. And uh, nobody's an apostle today. There's nobody today that meets the requirements of an apostle. So just understand that. The Bible is a complete revelation. And so there's no more special revelation, but what we need is spiritual revelation to what's already been written. For an example, in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 17, Paul said uh, in prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So we need the spirit to reveal uh, the truth that God's written down for us in his word. First Corinthians two talks about that, that the spirit of God reveals the things of God to us. And so the first thing is revelation. The second thing is inspiration. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 3, how did we get the Bible? That's what we're talking about. It's a five-step process. Number one, revelation. Number two is inspiration. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. So revelation demands inspiration. If God's going to reveal something, well, what's going to happen to that which has been revealed? It needs to be recorded, doesn't it? And writing is the best medium to permanently record that which you want to make known. Uh, having it written down is more sure than temporary experiences. For an example, in 2 Peter chapter 1, in 2 Peter chapter 1, the apostle Peter uh, talks about how he was an eyewitness of the majesty of Christ on that Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, they, they had a vision of Christ and his glory, and they heard the voice of the Father from heaven. And, and notice what Peter says about it, though. In verse 16 of 2 Peter 1, more, uh, excuse me, verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly, uh, cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So they saw this vision. Verse 17, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. Uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So they had a vision of Christ and they heard the voice of, of the Father speaking from heaven. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with them in the holy mount. But notice what he says. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter said that the Scripture is more sure than uh, the vision that Peter uh, partook in on the Mount of Transfiguration along with James and John. Now, you got people today that they're always wanting to have a vision. They're always wanting to have an experience. They want to hear a voice from heaven. That's not what God's doing today. That's not how he's working today. If God's going to speak to you today, it's going to be through the Bible that he gave you. There's no need for those visions. Everything God wants us to know has been revealed. The Bible's a complete revelation. It's been, uh, the, God's revelation has been fulfilled. Paul talked about that in Colossians 1, that he fulfilled the word of God. And he talked about it in 1 Corinthians 13 when he referred to that which is perfect. When that has come, well, that which is perfect has come. It's the complete revelation of the word of God. It's all been revealed. And so you're going to get led astray if you're looking for experiences and visions and voices and all of that, because that can all be counterfeited by the devil. But you have a written record of what God wants you to know, and you can study it, and you can check it, and, and it's, it's far better to have it in writing. And God gave us his revelation in writing in the Holy Scriptures. And so all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Scripture is pure writings. That's what that word means. The writings that God's given us to know that which he has revealed. And so it is the Scripture itself that is given by inspiration of God. Uh, inspiration of Scripture is a supernatural process. It's basically uh, the process by which the Spirit of God has given us the words of God. And so the big question is, do we have inspired Scripture today? The Bible says we do. A lot of so-called scholars will say, no, we don't. But who are you going to trust? Where are you going to put your confidence? Uh, inspiration of Scripture is a supernatural process that cannot be confined to man's limited and strict, uh, strict definitions they try to put upon it. Uh, the so-called scholars try to tell us that inspiration is limited to the original writings and that there is no inspired Scripture available to us today. But the context of 2 Timothy 3.16, when it talks about inspiration of Scripture, teaches us that Timothy's family had inspired Scripture and that all believers must also have it to be thoroughly furnished in all good works. 
salvation, growth, and Christian service, it's all based on having the inspired Word of God. How could God expect me to believe and obey truth that He's not given me? He said, man should not live by, every, uh, by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Well, I'm going to need those words then. And God has made them available to us. Notice in 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, he said that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration. Well, Timothy had holy scriptures from a child. He did not have the original writings of the Old Testament. No way. But what he had was copies, and God called it holy scripture. And he said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And he did, the, the verse doesn't say all scripture was given by inspiration. It said all scripture is given. So the bottom line is, if, if you have inspired scripture, you have the living words of God. The spirit of God uses those words. It's a living word because it's the words of the spirit of God. God has given us the scripture. And we have that today. There's no doubt about it if you believe what the Bible says. Nowhere in this Bible is it taught that only the original writings uh, were inspired. That's not in the Bible. When you study inspiration in the Bible itself and put your confidence in what the Bible says about itself, you'll come away from that believing that you have a copy of all Scripture given by inspiration of God. Number three is preservation. In Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, it says, the, uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so the pure words that are written in the scriptures, uh, God has promised that he would preserve them, that he would keep them. So inspiration demands preservation because what good would it be for God to give scripture by inspiration and then not keep it around for man to read? The whole purpose of inspiration is for God to reveal himself to man. What would be the purpose of that if he's going to inspire something and then man doesn't have it? We have to have it. There are many verses that teach the preservation of Scripture. For an example, Christ said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, notice that, words, my words shall not pass away. That's Matthew 24, 35. You know, God let the original writings perish because they were not necessary. We don't have to have the originals. Satan in the world has attacked the Word of God, but Satan in this world is going to perish while the Word of God endures forever. Peter said, The Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1, 23. You look in Jeremiah 36 and you have a great illustration in Jeremiah 36 of how men attack the Word of God. The, the wicked king Jehoiakim cut up the prophecy of Jeremiah with his penknife. And threw it in the fire, but God gave it again. And we still have the book of Jeremiah today. Jeremiah 36 is a great illustration of how God takes care of his word. You know, the inspired word of God has been continually copied and translated throughout history. And we still have it today because God has preserved his word. The God who created the world can certainly take care of his own words and make sure we have them despite the attack of Satan, despite the attack of men, despite the amount of time that's gone by and the fact that the Word of God has been translated, God has kept His words pure for us. And if you study the history of the Bible, it's very easy to trace a pure stream of manuscripts going all the way back to Antioch. That's where they were called Christians first, Acts chapter 11. And you can also see a corrupt stream of manuscripts going all the way back to Alexandria, Egypt. And if you check your Bible, you'll find there's nothing good in Egypt, according to the Scripture. And these uh, corrupt manuscripts go back to Alexandria. So those two streams of manuscripts, a pure stream and a corrupt stream. That makes sense because God said that he would keep his words pure. And yet Paul said, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. He said that in 2 Corinthians 2.17. So there are many out there being used of the devil to try to corrupt the word of God. So you have a, a pure stream and a corrupt stream. Number four is propagation. Number one, revelation. Number two, inspiration. Revelation demands inspiration. Inspiration demands, number three, preservation. And preservation demands propagation because it's the will of God that his truth be made known to all the world. 
In Psalm 68, verse 11, it said, The Lord gave the word, and great was the company that published it. Propagation, publishing of the word, getting the word out. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, Paul said that God will have all men to be saved and come into knowledge of the truth. Well, if God wants all men to be saved and come into knowledge of the truth, it makes sense then that God would make sure that his word was propagated. In preserving his word, he's also going to propagate his word. And that leads us to the last point. And we only have a couple minutes left, but let me spend the last couple minutes with this last point of translation. Inspira Revelation demands inspiration. Inspiration demands preservation. Preservation uh, demands propagation. And propagation demands translation because how can the nations know God without his word in their language? And yet the scholars say that a translation cannot be inspired. They say only the original languages can be inspired, Hebrew and Greek. Uh, yet the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say a translation cannot be inspired. In fact, there are many inspired translations in the Bible. In Acts 22, when Paul stood up and spoke in Hebrew uh, to the Jews in Jerusalem, Luke recorded it in Greek. And nothing was lost in the translation and we have it today in English, and nothing's been lost in the translation. Do you think the Holy Ghost would have any trouble giving Scripture in different languages? Think about the day of Pentecost when there were Jews from all these nations that came to Jerusalem on that feast day and heard the Word of God in their own tongues. That supernatural, miraculous thing that happened on Pentecost, they heard it in their own tongues by the Holy Ghost. So, look, God has no trouble with languages. He's the one that invented languages. And he has no trouble getting his word in other languages. Inspired scripture being translated is not limited to English, but there must be a standard. There must be a final authority. And, you know, we're living in the mystery age revealed through the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul said, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. And the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles in this age. Well, the language that is spoken by the most Gentiles is English. It's the world language. More people know English than any other language. And it's interesting to study the refining process of how God gave us his perfect word in English. There were earlier English translations that were good, but they weren't perfect like the King James. And then there were, you know, there's been some additions of the King James, uh, standardized spelling issues, font issues, and things like that. But the King James has never been revised. We have the, the 1611 in a 1769 edition, not a revision, but an edition because of standardized spelling and printing errors and whatever. But the modern English versions are based on corrupt manuscripts and therefore differ from the King James Bible in hundreds of places. And on our next study, we're going to compare the King James Bible to the corrupt modern versions. Thank you for watching the broadcast, and I hope you'll join us again next time.